Okay, this is the first shot of the movie that we saw where we're first introduced into Jake's world for the very first time, and we see his apartment where he lives, and we see him waking up with an alarm to try to get to work. Um, you'll notice that the apartment, the room as it were, is extreme state of disarray, and the reason that it is and everything is like that is because it used to be very clean and we dirtied it up for the movie. Uh, you'll notice that all the books are cluttered, but at the same time they're all facing with their spines away from the camera. The reason that they are like that is because we don't want to get into a lot of, uh, you know, releases and all that. Um, you'll notice that there's a kind of a weird painting on the wall, and that painting uh, is something that I made, as well as two other paintings in that room, uh, the night before we actually filmed in this, uh, in this room. One of them you saw at the very beginning of that shot, which is the one with the, uh, the guy standing next to the flame of fire, kind of on his left side there. Um, the little television that you can see here in the center of the shot, a uh, little black and white television that we found someplace la lying on the side of the road and it turned out that it worked and it was actually a very nice little vintage television so we kind of kept it. Um, you'll notice that there's what appears to be clutter on the bottom right hand side and that's just some computer parts that we also found and kind of threw down there. Uh, you'll notice up in the top right hand side there's a little uh, Super 8 film camera. We went and labeled all those uh, boxes and film reels and cans and, and everything that you see on the right side there. Um, the reason that we labeled everything is we wanted to make everything feel like it was kind of lived in. And that, uh, you know, this guy's been making movies for a while and he just hasn't been very successful at it, unfortunately. We also put in some red and black uh, stripes on, on some of the, uh, the folders on the right side. And the reason we did that also is to increase the uh, contrast and put some color in the shot in a certain way. Uh, we try to avoid as much as possible bright happy colors until he meets uh, the girl that he's gonna meet which is Rachel and we try to keep a lot of dark toned and kind of reddish toned things in the in his apartment. Um, you'll see that the lamp above his right shoulder and I do mean by right shoulder as in the audience's or our perspective of his body as his physique, not his left shoulder as he's facing us, but his right shoulder as it appears to us. So the practical lamp in the, the actual shot just has a 75 watt bulb inside it. That is the actual instrument that we're using to light him. There's no other lighting that is coming from behind his body that's creating that rim light on his hair and on his shoulders and his back. And as you can see here in this wide shot, the, uh, this particular bulb in the lamp is spreading out a lot and it's affecting everything. It's uh, actually flooding the entire area, including the carpet and the, um, the curtains. And we didn't really want that, so the DP here is going to go ahead and turn it off. He's going to replace this floodlight bulb in there, which is just a standard household bulb, with a spot bulb. And I want you to see the difference here. When you put spot bulbs in practicals, you have a lot more control over them. They turn into practically studio lamps. And watch this. So you can see there's a lot more control now in the shot. Um, it's a lot more focused. It doesn't just flood everywhere. It's actually more spotted onto Jake. Now notice the exposure on Jake in this particular, with this particular bulb. And here's with the other bulb. It's the exact same exposure on his face. You can see the highlights are exactly the same. However, when you look at everything else that's around that area, watch this you'll notice that everything is darker. The carpet's darker, the, uh, the curtains are darker. Um, that's actually a very, very good thing because we want to concentrate attention only on Jake. Here's with the floodlight again. You'll notice that there's a lot more exposure on the carpet and especially on the curtain, which is right behind Jake's head, and we don't want that. So try to use spot bulbs in your practicals. This RE 650 watt uh, lamp is, the, uh, is being bounced off of the ceiling and acting as a fill light for the situation. The reason you need to fill it is just to kind of fill in the shadows a little bit because we don't want it to be too contrasty. I just had spot before. I'm going to flood it out and I'm going to bring the barn doors in and just basically create a streak across the ceiling. That's flooding. And that's our streak. Um, but the, the actual practical lamp, which is burned out white here, and it's, it is an acceptable burned out white, the reason being is that it is a light source. And a light source, it's acceptable for it to be burned out in the shot uh, because it's actually providing illumination. Um, it is a kind of up to your uh, prudence as, as to whether you'd like for a practical to actually light the shot or not. 
uh, we will show you in other DVDs how to make a practical look like it's lighting the shot but not actually lighting the shot. But in this case the highlights in his hair and his shoulder are actually being made by that practical lamp and that kind of makes it feel really nice and realistic. Um, it's also being used to light the computer that's sitting on the table. The light that is actually behind the, um, the bookshelves to the back there, that is actually another light that we have back there, which is also just a regular practical lamp that's sitting up there. Um, here is a little bit of a shot where we're showing essentially what it's going to look like when the, the lighting is bad. You can see that there's a very distinct shadow of that lamp on the back wall, which in, case, in this case is a burgundy curtain. Another thing about this uh, set, you'll notice, is that the light feels kind of fake. Um, if you notice that the wall on the right side is kind of uh, burned out and there's a little bit of a gradient there, there's a shadow from the, uh, the painting on the wall, there's uh, a lot of light hitting that white um, bookshelf on the, uh, in the center top of the frame. Um, it's, I mean, it's not a badly framed shot, it's just that it just has horrible lighting, um, at least in my opinion. Uh, it just doesn't feel natural, doesn't feel right. Um, the shot from before, when we switch back and forth from this shot to the shot from before, which in my opinion has proper lighting, you'll notice that there's a lot less shadow in the frame. Um, you're more concentrating on Jake himself rather than on this, you know, blaring white object in the uh, top center, in, in the top center of the frame, which is the bookshelf. And, you know, Jake is just kind of another occupant of this habitat. You have to always look at a room as a two-dimensional object when it's being photographed because it's no longer, you're no longer perceiving in three dimensions. You're not perceiving uh, Jake or the, the countertop or the table or the, the bookshelf in the back. You're just perceiving one whole frame with items inside it that are either white or dark. You can see that another problem with using any kind of direct harsh lighting like that is that there's a lot of shadows in the frame of the crew members right now moving around inside the shot. And that will happen in any situation. Sometimes you won't have a nice big monitor like we did on the set and you won't see those kind of things, but um, they do happen. So lighting soft and using bounce for you know the ceiling or the walls for, for bouncing the lights is always going to give you a little bit of a easier frame to work with if you have any kind of dollies, jibs, or if you have people moving about the set or in a situation like this where we were just essentially in about a 15 by 15 room. It was a very tiny little space and any little bit of movement was very big. So I'm going to go ahead and repeat the action that Jake is doing here. I asked him to over exaggerate his movements on this shot so that you can see kind of how a performer to over exaggerate and overdo his action on something like this. You'll see that the yawns are really big and everything's kind of like a big movement. And then you'll see the stark contrast when we actually get back into the shot and you see him kind of being a little bit more subdued um, and more filmic. So here's where we get into cycling through all the different gammas that uh, you know certain cameras can do. Um, you can see a lot of different looks that we can achieve by virtue of just varying where the tones, the mid-tones, are actually falling. Because where the mid-tones fall in a frame is going to vary the colors as well you can see that the couch changes color dramatically and so does the burgundy background but also the noise level goes up too when we go to certain higher gammas than certain lower gammas. Here's where we're going to actually turn off the fill light. Here it is off and you can really concentrate and see what we're losing. We're losing all that detail on the left side of his face um, as well as all the detail in the background. It kind of looks like just a big black thing back there. You don't really see that there's a contour of a curtain anymore. Um, it is extremely contrasty frame at this point. If that's the look you're going for, that's great. But in this case, we weren't. Here's yet another example of the same exact kind of thing. You can see us turning on and off the fill light there. Um, here it is off. You can see that you really can't see much of the frame. You can see the edge of her body and and the background there, and it's, uh, here, is, here it is when you turn it on, it feels like you can actually see the subject. It feels like it's an interior proper tungsten light, which is kind of yellowish and warmer tone. So let's talk about the dolly shots and all the different things that we did on each individual take and the reason why we kept or scrapped individual takes. Uh, the dolly track is on the bottom left-hand side of the screen right now. It's just out of frame, just off of to the left side of the frame. Here's another one coming up where you're going to see my hands in the right-hand side there on the frame, which is, uh, we had to scrap that shot, of course. Another thing I want to mention is that the reason that my hands are there is because I'm actually clapping for him to wake up at a certain time. We actually had to try to pace the dolly and the jib 
movement with his action and my hand with that clock that's in the background that's going from 7.59 a.m. to 8 a.m., which is when he's supposed to get up and actually go to work. So I would set the clock to 7.59, and I would run back, and I would keep track of the time on my watch, and right when it was about a second before, I would clap my hands so that he would wake up and jump up at the exact same moment when it hits 8 a.m., and then in post, I added the alarm sound. And here's David, the actor, asking me about what he exactly he's supposed to be doing um, and how he's supposed to be acting when the alarm goes off. And he's asking me if he's supposed to be over the top or subdued. And I said, no, you know, we're going to do it real natural, real subdued. And so when the alarm goes off, you're just going to open your eyes, you know, a little bit and kind of get up and then try to shut off the alarm. But you're not going to get up and just kind of jump out of bed and like we we're in a comedy or something. It's just not going to work for this particular scene. So here's a little bit of a cut in or a close up of the action from a little bit of a higher up angle. And you can see him reacting to my hand clap every single time. And then he goes over and kind of tries to turn off the alarm clock and gives up. And the reason that you want to be able to give a close-up from a different perspective is, as we discussed before, um, you want to always, whenever you go in to get a different shot, you always want to vary the angle of the shot and also the height of the shot and the framing. Now here's something called a jib down shot, where we're actually using the jib to come down closer and closer to Jake and kind of do a little bit of a rotational move too at the same time. It's a really interesting thing. It takes a real steady hand to get these shots off really well. Uh, you'll notice that the DP is extremely well practiced in this craft and he's actually taking his time making sure that the, uh, the shot is being executed very well. Um, on a lot of times when you end up on larger sets you'll have somebody doing this for you but on smaller sets you're gonna probably as a DP end up doing all these things yourself and it's better to practice at your craft very well. Here's where you can see the track on the left side as we're dollying in with the jib still attached to the tripod. And this is kind of a reveal because you're not tilting to reveal something by using the tripod. You're actually using the jib to come up on the subject and reveal them slowly. Um, you do that usually to reveal a costume. You'll find that reveals are probably the most powerful weapon you'll have as a filmmaker because it allows you to maintain a close-up or a medium shot and interest in the subject but at the same time keep moving into other facets of the scene. Here is a Dutch shot where we're actually rolling the camera to the left and to the right in order to change the entire cant of the camera. Now you can use a Dutch angle anytime you want to alter the audience's perspective on a certain uh, normal shot and make it feel kind of like something is out of place. Um, in this situation, we tried it. We didn't really like the way that it looked, but there's a lot of other situations where you would want to cant or roll the camera to the right by using the tripod legs and shorten the, the tripod legs only in one direction to kind of uh, make, that, um, make that kind of frame seem kind of odd. And they've been using that since the days of the black and white films to uh, you know, kind of force the audience to look at the scene in a whole different way as though something is awry, something is wrong with the frame, something is wrong with that world and uh, something is happening that is unusual. Um, you can use that as a device, just try not to overuse it because then you end up with uh, something that looks kind of precocious. Okay, this is a scene where we're going to be walking back with Jake into his world at home. And this is right after he comes back from work, right before he enters into his dream world. And he sits down, turns on the practical lamp. Um, so it's really nice to have a lamp that's actually lighting him, that's creating that nice rim light on, the ba on his back that is actually also a practical lamp that can be turned on and off. He lays down in the, uh, on the couch, and the uh, jib kind of floats closer towards him. He starts reaching towards his dream world. What, what I want you to think about is, in this moment, essentially, what you're seeing in front of you is like all of your hopes and dreams even though it's just like this kind of like this little crime scene and everything right. but you got to imagine that in your mind uh, to, to him to, to, this, to Jake this is like um, everything he wants to be in life everything he wants to do in life is happening right in front of him and there is some kind of a barrier that's impeding him he cannot <coughs> cross this barrier it is physically impossible for him to cross over that threshold and get into right. that world so he just can't he can't do it but everything he wants is like right the there, and he wants it so badly, he's forcing himself to hallucinate, to get to that world. It's the only way he can do it. The only way he can do it is to come back home and go to sleep, to get himself into that dream state. Right. 
so that he's able to feel like that he's in that world. So how that works for you personally, okay, is I want you to think about what you want. And when I see you on that camera, I want you to be see, reaching out to that. what you want. I want you to get into that sense memory and think about either something in the past that has happened to you or you want really wanted or currently right now what you hope to aspire right. and see that you're imagining that right in front of you. And it'll okay. take us a few, three or four time, more times to get it, but I just want you to kind of perfect that idea that in your mind every on. single time. Okay. Okay? All right. Let's try that. Uh, what we're going to show you first is how to do it badly. And you can see that there is a lot of really bright light up on the top of the wall there. The framing is off. You see the back of his head in a very unflattering kind of way. Um, you can see that the jib is kind of dodging back and forth and not really uh, floating. Uh, Jake is behaving kind of, he's, uh, he's moving around in an erratic way, not in a smooth, controlled way. There's a shadow on the background, on the curtains, where essentially one of the crew members is moving his head back and forth. Um, that is kind of like a worst case scenario and we're going to do it one more time and we're going to get him to sit down again. There's a lot of shadows again on the background. It looks absolutely horrible. The framing is off and then when he sits down, he's going to lay down with his blocking in the correct, in the completely incorrect direction towards the camera as well. It seems kind of amateurish when you see it all already in a good way and now you see it in a bad way, but it's just one of those things where you really want to think about the blocking and the subject and the direction of the face way before you even arrive on the set preferably in a storyboard. Here you can see the track on the left side. That's crap, that shot. We caught that later on, actually. And then you can see that the jib isn't following properly with him. It's kind of descending after he sits down where it's supposed to really keep track of him. It's cutting off the top of his head right there. And then when he lays down, you can see the jib is also not keeping track of him, and it kind of floats back down towards him, and it makes a hard stop at the end. So all those things make sure, make the shot essentially unusable, and then we have to do it again. Um, also, uh, Jake wasn't exactly sure which hand he's supposed to reach out with because we hadn't gone over that. Here's the track again on the left hand side. You can see that very clearly, the track for the dolly. We're going to go ahead and attempt the uh, the shot again. You can see my shadows there on the, the floor. And eventually I'll settle down so that the shadows will also settle down. There's a shot where we got too close to him and he wasn't able to reach into the camera because the camera was just way too close. Here's when we got too close to him again. These are all individual takes. We have to do it again and again and again. Here's where he bumps his head. And here's one last take which we actually did not use. So we had to do 15 takes to settle on one that we actually liked, and that was take number 13. And sometimes you have to do that. Sometimes you have to perform the entire action 15 times really to allow the actor to kind of move into the, the role better and rehearse something enough times that it actually feels realistic and feels good. And if you're shooting in a non-linear kind of manner, if you're shooting to disc instead of actually to tape, uh, by all means, you do not have to keep all those takes. Um, you can review them in the field, or if you are reviewing them as you go on a nice large monitor, you know exactly what you're getting, then there's no reason to keep all those other takes. I mean, we shot take number 14 and 15 essentially as safeties. Uh, we already knew that take number 13 was going to be our best one, and there's really no reason to keep all the other 12 that came before. Um, if you want to, you can, but if you're conserving space, you really don't have to do that. If you're shooting to tape, then it doesn't really matter. It's a moot point. You already have it on the tape. Uh, but when you are shooting to disc, you can go ahead and delete anything that you don't enjoy. Um, we kept uh, everything essentially because we're doing this presentation here, and it's good to show all the bad takes, but you do not have to do that. Okay, so in this scene, all we did is essentially whip the lights around, and are you still using the exact same practical 75-watt lamp to light his face? And we're also still using the RE 650-watt light, as bounce off of the left side to fill in the sh the shadow side of his face. Otherwise, as we've seen before, the shadow side becomes completely black and you can't see anything in there. You can see there's another practical lamp in the background there in the top right hand side. And that's just kind of in there just to kind of liven up the background a little bit. You can see a little bit back there. 
And there's also a light right behind his head, also illuminating that painting that's sitting on the uh, on the shelf. And all that is just a small 20 watt equivalent light that's very very soft and dimmed down. And uh, essentially in the shot it's where he has come back into his world and he still has his hand outstretched and then he pulls his hand back down and he's panting and he's just uh, you know come out of that dream world and he's coming back into reality and we shot the scene back to back with the scene right before that where he was just laying down on the couch uh, we shot a couple more scenes that day this is our first day with David shooting so uh, we had to do quite a few takes because we were it was just our first day working together we hadn't had a chance to do a lot of rehearsals essentially we just hired him a couple of days before that for this movie and uh, he did a great job this day he did an absolutely fantastic job for our first day on the on the set not really knowing his character and entering right into it and you know just flying with it very very well um, but we'll see a lot of retakes here where we have to continuously back and forth kind of keep working with him and, and refining the character and getting him to really feel you know like Jake and feel like this is exactly happening to him as it was happening to Jake and not to David and you'll notice that that will happen to you with your actors as well I mean you'll find that the first day they they really don't have the hang of their character yet and the more rehearsal that you do beforehand before you actually arrive on the set the more of a prepared actor you're going to have to work with where you're paying people and you're renting equipment by the day and the more days that it takes you to accomplish what you're trying to do uh, the more that you're going to run over budget so the more you prepare with your actor beforehand if you have time if you're able to do that um, the better it is going to be for you when you actually arrive on the set so here's a shot that we put in to kind of illustrate how we change the background a little bit. Here's one shot where the background has a lot of clutter in the back, but that doesn't really fit his personality because somebody else actually lives in this apartment. And here it is where we actually covered it up with some clothing, those little paint bottles that, um, you know, he just wouldn't really have, I don't think, just not really fitting his personality. So we covered him up with some clothing to uh, dress up the background real fast instead of having to move in all, the, all those actual bottles. You'll also notice that in the back behind him, all the videotapes are sitting on their faces with their with their backs facing us so that you don't you can't see the titles and as well the spines of the books are all turned away from the camera. You can't see any of those as well. Now here's where we're actually going to do a little bit of lighting and you can see the lighting changing on him and as well as the background. Uh, some parts of his face are burning out a little bit depending where we're pointing the uh, the spotlight, which is just that practical lamp. You'll see it kind of changing in the uh, on the top right hand side of the frame and we eventually arrive at a certain lighting that we like and you can see the lighting on the background changing as we change the light on him um, we don't want to over light the background and draw too much attention to that we want to keep the attention on Jake himself and eventually you'll notice here that the background light has been turned off and here it is kind of dimming back up and down until we found just the right illumination level that we were happy with so it's really nice to have things on dimmers and there's on the right side another practical that's being used to light the curtain. We actually eventually scrapped that because we thought it was just too overlit. It just didn't fit the uh, fit the bill. Uh, but that's another way to kind of make it feel like the lighting on the curtain is motivated from that background light itself. Here's where we actually turned off that light on the side there because we just didn't like the way it looked. Here he is actually with his hand outstretched in the first take and we're starting to work with him on the uh, the takes back and forth. The camera is sitting on a jib so that we can jib with him as he leans backwards. Mm. You don't have to go in that far. Where? Could be a smaller move. Yeah, like that could be your max. You're your in. Um, and here I am actually telling him to raise his hand up a little bit and adjust it a little bit and we pull the camera back and we wait for him to get into character he's starting to pant there a little bit more here we go and then he kinda leans back and then we lean the camera forward with him it didn't quite work out this one time as the first try and here he is adjusting his hand again he was panting get into character leaning back and then we kinda move the camera in the camera's kind of bobbing a little bit left and right, and the reason being is that it's on a jib and not a dolly. You don't really have a lot of control over the left and right movement when you're on a jib. Raise your hand a little bit, David. Uh, off to the right a little bit more, to your right. To your right, keep your hand right there. Um, 
lower it a little bit. Right there. Stand by. And action. One more time adjusting his hand up into the frame. A little bit more to the left of the frame to kind of fill in that dead space. And here he is starting to pant and get into character and then he leans back and we move in with him very slowly this time. Uh, what the DP is giving me is just a, a lot of different takes on the same kind of an action uh, from the camera side and that's a really good thing because it gives us a lot more options later on in post-production. And here's when the DP is setting up the camera on a tripod so we can get a more steady shot because we realize that we didn't like the whole bobbing left and right of the movement of the camera there so we wanted to get at least a couple of steady shots before we close the, that scene. And here he is hooking up the YRB component cables so that I can watch what he's doing on the, uh, on the monitor, on the professional monitor. He's leveling the camera right there, adjusting his LCD, panning the camera, taking a focus, getting into position. And here we get back to Jake and he's raising his hand position getting into character here he is starting to pant and he drops his hand and leans back and this was just a zoom just to kind of illustrate the difference between an actual camera moving in or zooming in here he's dropping his hand again leans back and we move in with him again really slowly This time he drops his hand, and we're kind of going to move in with him again. This time there's a lot more headroom. It's an unacceptable shot. This time he just dropped back, and we just tilted down with him. And here we are putting some water on his face to make it feel like he's a little bit more sweaty. We weren't charming him there. <laughs> and we're going to have him drop his hand, lean back, and just tilt down with him. This is the actual shot that we end up going with. Uh, the reason being is it just felt a lot nicer than the uh, than the actual shot where the, the camera moved in closer to him. Um, if it were on a dolly, it probably would have felt a little bit nicer, but because it was on a jib, it was kind of bobbing left and right. It didn't quite feel right. And there's another tilt down with a tripod. You'll find that the tripod is really the most useful implement on the set. The last thing I want to do is kind of really demonstrate to you the difference between a dolly shot and a zoom shot. And here we are again this is a dolly shot and here is the zoom shot and I want you to look at the change in perspective when you're actually using the dolly you actually feel like you're getting closer to the actor whereas when you zoom you're just magnifying a certain part of the frame the dolly shot always feels more natural because we as human beings can approach a subject we can walk closer to it and the perspective changes with it but a zoom shot on the other hand always feels fake because our eyes can never zoom. We're not bionic. We don't have that ability to zoom into a certain aspect of the shot. We can either dolly or we can cut with our vision from, let's say, a wide shot like this one to a medium shot and then cut again to a close-up. It's really easy to prove it to yourself. Just look around the room that you're in right now and look at different objects and see if you can actually zoom in with your sight onto any one individual object. You, you can't do it. The only thing you can do is you can actually get up and actually get closer to the object or you can look at object A, object B, object C or look at it closer with your vision from a wide shot to a medium shot to a close up but you're always cutting or you're dolling, you're never zooming. But we are not able to zoom in real life so that's why zoom shots always feel fake and unrealistic and they take the audience out of that suspended disbelief that they're actually watching something that's a, a reality somewhere else and it just feels like you're watching actors on the set. So you want to try to avoid zooming unless you're doing something more cliche or something for effect. Um, dollying and cutting is usually where you want to stay at. Those are the things that actually feel most natural to the audience. Okay, so in this shot, essentially all we did is just whip the camera over to the other side of the couch. Okay. Rolling? Yeah. Just uh, do the painting counter right here. And we kept the lights pretty much exactly where they were. We didn't really have to do much relighting. The uh, practical light on the left side is still kind of rimming the left side of his body. And we also have the uh, 650 watt tungsten Fresnel bouncing against the ceiling and still bringing in all that soft fill light on his right side of his body. 
You also notice that we use the light panel on the right hand side right there to fill in the right side of his face and give him a little more edge and more separation from the background. The reason we did this shot for is because this is when he comes out of his world and we wanted a shot where we see his face from the front and then also from the back and this matches up with where he's on the crime scene and he's watching the two detectives. So we use this framing when we actually shot the crime scene much later on, a few four, you know, four or five days later on, and we try to match the frame as closely as possible when he's um, sitting down at the crime scene watching the two, the two detectives. So you'll see him kind of reaching forward there, allowing us to do a little bit of effects later on, and he kind of uh, he's panting and he lays back. And th the thing is that he has to keep panting exactly the same way. You can see his shoulders kind of rising and lowering because if he doesn't do that it will cause another kind of jump cut. That jump cut is not just a jump in the action or in the time space, it is a jump in the performance as well too because something he was doing on another shot, this is supposed to be the, the reverse angle of that shot just over his shoulder and if he's not performing the exact same type of action, the exact same type of, type of intensity, it just won't work. The audience will, it will feel cheated, it just won't, it won't cut properly. And here's a closer shot. Um, you always want to shoot a little bit of a closer shot. You know, even when you feel like you've got the wide shot and you're very confident of it and everything's great, you always want to shoot one shot that's a little bit closer, just so you can have a slightly different perspective in post. You never know if you're going to need it later on. Another thing that you'll notice is he's turning his face all the way to the left and all the way to the right. And actually, you'll hear me in the set, uh, and I was exactly telling him to do that. I was telling him to keep turning his head until it would actually hurt him a little bit. Because if he turns it until he's comfortable, you still won't see his face turning all the way to the camera. He has to continue turning without turning his shoulders until he actually feels that it's uncomfortable. And that's when it actually looks good to the camera. It's just one of those things that, he, you know, he as a professional actor understands he has to make a, a few sacrifices. Now for the next shot, all we did is just kind of brought him into the apartment. It's just, we just turned all the lights around and we got him actually coming into the apartment for the first time. We had a whole different set of lighting on him. We essentially shot all the things that we needed from the other scene first. And now we brought him into this other scene, whipped the lights around and got a whole different uh, set of uh, lighting arrangement. You can see there's a little bit of a bluish light on his body there, and we intended that to kind of feel like it's kind of uh, uh, some kind of a skylight or maybe a, a kitchen light of some sort. So there's the DP adjusting the light that's going to end up causing that blue light to happen on Jake's body. And there's the actual light coming out of it. He's spotting it in and out right now and adjusting the barn doors to get that exact right pattern on him. He's actually moving it up right now to get a little bit of a higher angle to get it to hit his face. Um, and he's going to go ahead and he's going to see what that looks like. And he's going to run over to the monitor right there and take a look at it. And that's what I'm going to tell him that I kind of liked it better when it was just hitting his midsection and not hitting the, uh, the top of his body as well, too, in his face. So he's going to go ahead and lower it and set it right there. And he's going to eventually put a blue gel on it. You won't see him do that, but he's going to put a blue gel on the light to make it have that kind of bluish tone to it and not make it look yellow. And you can see where he comes to an actual stop um, that the light in his face is extremely harsh. Now, it is not overexposed. Um, he's actually very well exposed and he's got a nice rim light on the right side of his face, but the light is very harsh, um, meaning that um, it is not soft, it is not balanced. And so here's the DP. He's bouncing the, uh, the light off the back wall to try to create a little bit of a softer light on Jake's face. From him to the light is four foot three. So instead of hitting him directly with the light, we're bouncing it off of the wall, and then the light is coming off of the wall and bouncing back into Jake's face, and we're increasing the size of the light to be very large and very soft. And then to the wall itself is eight foot six. When you bounce a light off of the wall, it becomes extremely large. As you can see, the, uh, the circle that's being made on the wall, that becomes your, your large surface that is being used to actually light the actor. So it wraps around his face and becomes a very, very soft light. That's what makes it so nice. Okay, and then also to this light. Is seven foot 10. And here we see the before with the har harsher light. And here's the after. You can see that the, uh, the light on his face is a lot softer and more natural and it seems more realistic. Here's the hard light again. Here's the soft light again. 
and we inadvertently gave him a little bit of a greenish cast because we, by bouncing light into the wall, which has a little bit of a green kind of tint to it, we ended up bouncing back a lot of that greenish kind of cast back into his face, and that's something we're going to fix later in post-production. Here we are also measuring the distance to Jake at position one at the door. I'll pull a little tighter. Which number? <laughs> so, here's the feet. Um, I'm confused. 18, 18. And we 18 feet, move yeah. him to position two and take another measurement reading. And then we essentially look at that on the camera and make sure that he moves between those two parameters for the focus, that we're not overshooting the focus in any direction, either before or after that frame. Okay, and go ahead. Uh, I didn't like his end framing there because the uh, the fan was right behind his head, so we had him do the entire action again. You can see that bluish light again on the door and on his body as he enters. It kind of separates it. Uh, we have a very small area to work with, and we want it to make it feel like he's traversing a larger distance, and the only way to do that is with lighting to kind of create pockets of light. So here's pocket number one with a little bit of the bluish tone on his body, pocket number two with the uh, light coming from the right side, and pocket number three with the light coming from the left side again. So one, two, three, it feels like he's traversing a larger distance. Uh, it makes it feel like it's a natural environment with a lot of different uh, practical element lights inside the shot. Um, it's just a, a nicer, more realistic appearance to the environment rather than just having one blaring light in his face as before. Here's yet another example why you don't want to have any hard light sources hitting your subject on video because you notice that the subject um, when cast a shadow on the background, which is actually moving. We'll repeat it again here so you can see it. You see the shadow is actually moving with the subject. It's very distracting and not very pleasant. Here it is nice and soft. It's just a nice fill light. You can still see her. You can see all the details in the set, but there's no distracting shadow moving against the background with her. Um, it feels more natural. It feels more realistic. Um, it doesn't feel like it's just a set, and it doesn't feel like video anymore. It feels like it's a movie. Here it is with the soft key turning on and off that does not cast a shadow. And here is the hard key that actually does cast a shadow. Here it is again, soft. And the hard light source that casts a shadow. Here's the one that casts the hard shadow. It's just a 150 watt spot aimed directly at her. And here's the 300 watt soft light that's being aimed at the ceiling and bouncing off the ceiling and back into her face. Okay, so on this shot, what we did is we just got done with that shot before and we were in this location. We still had a little bit more time. We really didn't want to just kind of scrap the location and move on to the next, uh, the next item on the list. We really wanted to shoot as many things as we could for this location and just get done with it as quickly as possible. So we moved ahead in the script to the point when he comes back after his accident. This is no longer when he's just coming back from work. This is right after he has an accident in the SUV. Uh, we just had him do a change of wardrobe. We changed the lighting a little bit. And we just had him come back into the house at that point. And, you know, he's, he's got a little bit of uh, dust on his, uh, on his shirt. Um, he's a little ruffled. He's kind of uh, trying to, uh, you know, he, he's trying to kind of com calm down a little bit and come down from his experience that he just had. Um, this dusting that you see on his, on his shirt, obviously we didn't just come back from the accident scene. We haven't even shot the accident scene at this point, but he still has to be in that character. So we just took his, some baby powder and just kind of dusted his shirt up with it a little bit so it just looks like he just rolled on the floor. Um, the, the hardest part for an actor, you'll see he's out of focus there because we hadn't actually taken the focus points yet. And eventually after that we'll do the measurements for the focus and we'll redo the entire shot again knowing where the focus points are. Um, this is the hardest thing for the actor is to appear as though he has just encountered something or experienced something that he hasn't really even experienced yet, even in the world of the movie yet. He has to kind of read the script and be ready for it and rehearse it and know what he's going to be doing with feedback from the director as well, of course, so that he kind of you know knows exactly what's going on before we actually get to it. And here's where we ended up on the frame. I really didn't like that fan coming out of his head, kind of, so we had to reshoot the whole thing again. And here you see we finally have a proper frame where his, where his head is actually not in the, uh, the fan anymore, which is just kind of a, a really odd sort of frame. 
Okay, so back to lighting a little bit. Here's one shot where we turned off that fill light that was filling in the right side of the frame and kind of creating that nice little pocket of light that he would pass by before he got into the kitchen area. Um, it does create a little bit more of a moody type of atmosphere. Again, that is not what we were looking for at this point. We wanted something that was a little bit more evenly lit. Um, you can also tell that uh, generally with any type of camera, whenever you have that those areas of darkness there, you're going to get a little bit more noise in that area. Um, so see him when he actually kind of comes to a stop there. He's pretty dark and he's got a very low um, IRE level for his face. Now when the uh, fill light comes back on, you can really tell that he's kind of uh, separated from the environment. Um, he's separated from the background and there's more uh, there's more light on him that, that is able to kind of draw attention to him. Here it is again with no light. And here it is coming up again with the fill light. So it's important to kind of create those nice little pockets of light for the actor to go through from place to place. And all that has to do with blocking. When your actor knows what uh, point he's supposed to stop at, when you have uh, made him little kind of marks in the floor that he knows to hit those marks, uh, he'll know that he's, he's going to be in the light at that point and he's going to be visible and his action, his performance is going to be visible. He will always hit that mark. So here we're going to take a listen to the difference between an on-camera microphone and an actual proper professional shotgun microphone on the set. Um, the first shot's going to be the on-camera microphone, the next shot's going to be the shotgun microphone placed close to the action. So you can really hear the difference between all the things that you're losing. Um, if you don't have a proper professional shotgun microphone on the set, you're not going to get all those intricate little sounds like the door opening. Just listen to the difference for yourself. So let's take a listen one more time, but intercut much closer to each other. You can really tell a difference. And just to let you know, the on-camera mic was turned up as far as it'll go. And if we turned it up anymore, it would just overdrive completely. Okay, this was another fun thing that we got to do. Um, this is all still in the same day. We shot everything in the same day at this apartment. Um, we got all the scenes done pretty much for the entire movie in about two days, and this is still the same day. Um, you'll notice that the daylight is pouring in through the window on the right side. On the left side, all it is is just a little bit of a uh, pocket LED light that we uh, that we put in there, which is also daylight balance that creates that kind of blue effect. This is done in broad daylight, by the way. It's actually about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. That is actually full sunlight streaming in through the uh, 
to the curtains, but we underexposed it to a very high degree. And also just by, you know, very selectively opening the curtains. Here's what happens if you were to do it badly. Um, he opened the curtains too far. The exposure wasn't proper. Um, he, the, the framing wasn't right. You can see the background, the white wall in the back, and that kind of gives it away. Okay, this is for the bad one. We're going to let in more light and frame it up where we see this thing back here. Roll camera and action. Okay, and here we're going to watch the uh, DP assembling the LED light that we end up using in that particular shot. Um, he's going ahead and putting it with its battery on this uh, device right here. It's a couple of clamps joined with a rod, and he's going to attach the clamp uh, to the tripod. And we tried this uh, position first, but we didn't end up liking the, uh, the way that it was hitting his face. It felt like it was uh, hitting him too far from the right side of the frame. And so what ended up happening is that we removed it from the tripod and uh, we ended up holding it in place right there on the uh, left side in the center of the frame and lighting his left side of his face from that particular position just holding it really steady in that position so here we are with the LED light and we're kind of uh, changing the exposure on him with the little pocket LED light on the left side you can see it on the bottom left hand side of the frame there it's just a little battery operated light and it fills in the frame just enough for us to feel like there's some light there. Um, you don't really ne need to know where it's coming from. It might be a reflection of, of something that's inside the room, but it's just there and you, it allows you to see his performance and see his face. And here he is getting up and we didn't like the way he got up on that one, so we also found some debris on the floor that we needed to move that was kind of drawing too much attention. And here he is trying to get up again. We had him reverse his shirt, by the way, for the, the logo that was on the shirt because it was drawing way too much attention away from him. Okay, and we told him to kind of uh, uh, stretch out his beats a little bit, sit down a little bit longer and think about what he's doing. You'll notice the uh, the barn door on the right side of the camera there was visible, so we kind of addressed that on this shot and fixed it up. Okay, and here we are, and he kind of sits down. We told him to sit down a little bit and make longer beats, and that means that he's supposed to take his time at every single interval of his acting and then he comes up over here and we also didn't like the fact that you know with that white wall being there it just kind of gives away the shot that this is actually broad daylight not five o'clock in the morning so we decided to do it in a grouping of two shots this is the first shot now where he sits down and he keeps hearing that sound and he's thinking about what he, where it's coming from or what's he gonna do and he figures it out and he gets up and out of frame we don't actually tilt up with him anymore to see his action then we do another shot over here where he comes up and into the frame. We didn't like the way he got up there because it felt like he was just actually sitting on the edge of the couch and just got up. So we had him do it one more time. We also didn't like the light in his face because it looked like it was cutting off his nose there. So we had him move you know, back and forth, back and forth until we found just that right kind of rim light on his face that separates him. And here's another one that we shot with a slightly wider frame. And it's always good to get you know, slightly wider frames, close-ups, etc that you know just gives you a little bit more flexibility in post what if you don't like the way the close-up looks what if you need the wide shot you know it's nice to have more shots in post that you can go to um, so we ended up going with the close-up shot actually wardrobe continuity is very important and especially on these independent films you don't usually don't have a continuity person uh, watching you know the wardrobe from scene to scene so it's important for you as a director to keep track of what the actor is wearing on the uh, on the actual script and kind of just jot it down just so you remember from scene to scene and shot to shot what each actor is going to be wearing. Everybody like everybody like his look? Is that cool? Yeah. Definitely wardrobe is something that it's not a bad thing at all to get other people's opinion on it and also to ask a particular performance you know and ask them what do you think you would wear in a situation like this you may agree you may disagree but you know sometimes you're gonna end up agreeing with a performer because they have probably worn these clothes for other movies too and they may know what works for what kind of particular scene so always ask you know the worst thing that's gonna happen is you'll choose something else okay this is another interior scene that's in the exact same location as the last one we just moved further along to the left side of the curtain and this is when Jake is telling Rachel that he is losing confidence in himself and he's giving up on writing. And we're going to discuss primarily acting and communicating with your actors 
then audio, and then after that we're going to discuss lighting, white balance, and framing. So first, acting. Okay, I'll give you guys a way out of it. All you have to do is, after you kiss him, lay your head on his chest facing me. Oh, that would be so much better. Try okay. that. This way? Yeah. Are we holding hands? Hold the hands up high. No, no, up high. Yeah, there you go, up high. Give her the kiss. And immediately lay your head on his chest. No, further down. No, I'm sorry. Okay, <laughs> no, I see. Wait, on, on his shoulder, on his left shoulder. Oh. No, just on his left shoulder. There you go. Oh. There you go. Okay. This is when, um, take a listen to this. This is when Rachel is telling me, or actually Laura, the actress, is telling me that um, she's a little iffy on the dialogue and she's not feeling very confident. So here's my response to her as well, too. So yeah, if I'm iffy on the dialogue, though. Well, we'll, be patient we'll try this. it. Yeah, no, 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 we'll try it a couple times. Anytime an actor is trying to tell you that they're iffy in a dialogue or nervous or anything like that, just let them know that it's okay, and we'll try it a couple of times, and we'll see what happens. Um, whatever you do, don't take the uh, position of, well, you should have read your script, you should have practiced your lines, you should have rehearsed, etc., etc. It's too late. Always remember to be kind, be gentle, and be caring. And a kind, gentle, and caring director would never come up to an actor after saying something like that and go, uh, wow, you know, you really, really should have practiced. You should have done something more with your with your day yesterday. Uh, you should have taken more time this morning or last night. Um, that is not a good answer. Um, this is not a corporate situation. Um, you're not there to act as their mother or father to these people. What, what you're there to do is to direct their acting. If they're not acting, if you go ahead and screw up your relationship with your actors and they're not acting, then there's nothing for you to do. Uh, you might as well just tell the DP where to put the camera and then you guys can just shoot a blank wall. Um, it's, it's very important to uh, be kind, gentle, and caring with your actors. And always remember that more than likely they're giving you their best. And so if there's situations in their life that have predicated them to not be able to pr rehearse the day before or to practice their lines in any way, um, you have to be understanding of those situations. And yes, this is your time and you're paying for the set and you're paying for the, the, the gear and the people to be there. Uh, but now is not the time. Go ahead and move on with the scene. Do your best. See what you can do. Uh, even if it takes 10 or 12 takes, no big deal. Just go ahead and get the shot. And later on that night, maybe sit down with your actors and rehearse for the following day. So just whatever you do, don't be scolding on the set. Don't ever put, put an actor down for uh, not preparing as you would have wanted them to. Just move on. Do your best with your shot. Do your best with the scene. And at the end of the day, try to fix it for the following day. Stand by. And action. I give up. I just don't have the strength to do it. I thought that car almost killing me would be like a wake-up call to live again. I thought it would give me strength. But instead it just gave me fake courage. I'm right back where I started. Another roadblock. Just this time at page 25. I know where you're coming from, but it's not just going to be one and all of a sudden it'll happen for you and you can't wait for that one thing. It's a process. You can't let it get you down just because one thing didn't work out for you. You're on page 25. You have 25 other scripts that are at page 5. It's a start, right? Okay, so let's talk about audio. Um, right now, each one of them is wearing their own lavalier mics. Those are the little lapel mics that, um, that pretty much have a little microphone that sits near your mouth. And they have a transmitter, um, an audio transmitter, and that transmits back to the receivers at the camera. And also at the camera, because of the camera that we're using, it also records its own internal microphone on channels 3 and 4 all the time. So why don't you go ahead and take a listen to what my voice sounds like through their lavalier microphones. I'm about 15 feet away from them. Um, so their lavalier mics are transmitting back to the camera. Let's hear my voice through their microphones. Stand by. And action. Okay, now let's hear my voice through just the microphone that's built into the camera that's really close to where I'm speaking. Stand by. And... Action. Okay, now we're going to listen to Jake's audio through his own lavalier mic. Then we're going to listen to his audio through Rachel's lavalier mic so we can understand clearly just how important it is to have proximity 
when you're dealing with lavalier mics and to try to get him as close to the actor as possible, as close to his mouth as possible. I give up. I just don't have the strength to do it. Okay, so that was through his lavalier mic. Now this is through her lavalier mic. I give up. I just don't have the strength to do it. Okay, and so hopefully we've heard the richness of the voice when it comes through his own microphone as opposed to when it's bouncing off of the glass and back into her microphone about two feet away from his mouth. Um, it's just more tinny, it's more thin, there's no depth or uh, bass to it at all. Whereas his microphone is very nice and crystal clear and has a lot of depth to it and bass. So you want to try to get the lavalier microphone as close to the actor's mouth as possible. Okay, so now you've heard how when you use one microphone to record both people's audio, one of the people is going to end up paying the price if you're using lavalier omnidirectional microphones. So this is a lavalier microphone, the lapel mic, you know, or the neck mic or the tie clip mic, a lot of different names for it. It's just a little microphone that clips usually to the shirt or the tie or you hide it underneath somebody's shirt in order to record their personal audio. You do not want to record other people's audio on that particular microphone because it's designed to record within about a one to two foot radius of its own element, of its own recording element. When you go and record other people's audio around it, you're going to end up losing bass, you're going to end up losing the life and richness in the voice, and it's also going to get a lot lower too, as you heard when the, from the tests. So um, if you're, you're recording two people and you want to use lavalier microphones, make sure you have two of them, or at least have them repeat the scene, do one more take, but switch the, the microphone over to the other person and so that they can have the benefit of the better audio too. Um, ideally though, it's better to have two lavalier microphones, one in each person, both transmitting simultaneously to the camera into channels one and two. And you also got to hear the difference between that audio and the on-camera microphone's audio. So you want to try to always never use the on-camera microphone for any reason other than just, you know, I guess a scratch track just so you can get life sounds out of the scene. But all the dialogue should be recorded in lavalier mics or a boom microphone. Either you or the audio person or someone who's watching the script has to always have a set of headphones on their ears all the time. Don't just trust the level meter on your camera. You have to always have a good set of headphones and always listen to the dialogue through the headphones. If you're sitting in the same room and you think that you can hear everything, um, you're not hearing the whole thing. There's little things that are going to happen to that microphone that you just will not hear unless you have a good set of headphones on your ears. Okay, now let's also talk about how Jake stumbled in his line a couple of times. Here we go. I thought it would give me strength, but instead it just gave me fake courage. Okay, so when an actor is stumbling over his dialogue like that, there are two cures. Um, number one is to just do more takes and eventually he'll, you know, eventually work it through and he'll learn the lines through repetition. The other way is to stop for a moment, give him about five minutes, and allow them to go ahead and re-rehearse the lines back and forth, give him a moment to take a breather, and then go ahead and move on again to take number two. Um, I usually advise the second method um, as long as the actor is okay with it. Sometimes you'll ask him if they want to do that, and they'll say, no, 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 I really just want to keep shooting because they don't want to stop and rehearse. It's going to take them out of their character. So go ahead and listen to your actors, and you know if they tell you, no, I just want to keep shooting, it's okay. Um, if you don't feel very confident, just don't roll the camera. But by all means, don't just force them to do uh, one thing. You know, Don't force them to stop and rehearse. That usually puts them on the spot and ends up being uh, ten times worse than just allowing them to do what they want to do, which is just to do a few more takes. Now, as a director, once you notice that if they're doing two or three more takes and they're still stumbling or stuttering in the exact same spots or in different spots, then you just need to make a judgment call and stop it and say, okay, I want you guys to, you know, let's have a powwow and let's sit down and rehearse the whole scene again, just in case, you know, just to kind of make sure everybody's got their line straight. Um, but before that, give them a couple of chances to kind of redeem themselves and go ahead and try to do the scene again without stopping to, to rehearse because you really don't want to put the guys on the spot. Once you put them on the spot, they're going to lose confidence. And when they lose confidence, they're going to end up losing all their lines. And you'll find that it just goes downhill from there. They start stumbling everywhere and stuttering, and they, they just can't get the, the hang of their character anymore. And you end up having to do 27, 28 takes just to get a barely usable take that doesn't even work. And it also affects your relationship with your actors. So don't put them on the spot. If they're stumbling, stuttering, or if they're having problems with nervousness, 
always ask them, what would you like to do? Would you like to keep going or would you like to stop and rehearse? And they'll tell you how they feel and go with them on their feeling. After a couple of takes, if you don't feel like it's going where you want it to go, then you stop it because, and then they'll always tell you, oh, okay, okay, yeah, maybe we should stop and rehearse a little bit. They'll go with you on that. But just don't act like, you know, you know exactly what's right at every single situation. Um, be gentle, caring, and patient with your actors and ask them how they feel and what would they like to do and then go with that. That way you allow them to save face and remain in character and feel confident that you still have confidence in them as actors. Now let's go ahead and hear both of their audios through the camera microphone. Let's just say if you just had the camera microphone on there. Hurts your ears, doesn't it? Especially when you hear it first through the lavalier mic. The only thing really you want to use the on-camera microphone for is if you're using a uh, camera that can record four channels of audio, you want to use the on-camera microphone to record your uh, your instructions or your notes without letting the the actors hear what you're saying. So let's just say if you want to say, well, that was a good take or that was a bad take, and that way you can hear it later on in post-production when you get there. Um, you can just kind of whisper it into the on-camera microphone where nobody can hear you. The reason that I like um, lavalier microphones so much as opposed to boom microphones or, or on-camera microphones especially is because you don't require a second person on the set just to hold the boom mic. Um, you can just give each individual actor, as long as you're doing most of these things as uh, uh, you know, shots with two people and them talking to each other, which is what most independent films are really, um, you don't really need a third person on the set to act as a boom microphone holder uh, and just you know stand there with a boom mic the entire day and then have to worry about getting the boom mic uh, shadow in the shot. Uh, lavalier mics, especially wireless ones, just give you a lot of freedom. You can walk with your actors, you can send them wherever you want in the shot and not have to worry about cables dangling everywhere. Um, and each one of them has their own personal microphone that always gets you the best audio possible for that person. Um, there's a lot to be said for boom microphones. They're fantastic devices. Most professional productions use them, um, but they just complicate matters a little bit for small independent productions. Unless you're doing shots where you're dealing with uh, more than two people, um, where you're doing three people or more, you don't want to give, give each one of these people um, a microphone. You've got to just have one shotgun mic that records all their audio. Um, the other situation is if you're in a very, very tight budget and you can't even swing, for instance, the $1,000 that it takes to buy two wireless mics, then you can go ahead and just buy a $300 boom mic and just be done with that. Just get a boom pole, use that, and you're done. Um, you can buy a really, really, really good boom mic for about $1,000, which is what it would take to buy two you know, uh, good wireless transmitter-receiver combos. Um, so you can definitely get more bang for your buck with $1,000 and a, a boom mic than with wireless uh, systems. However, the wireless systems just give you the freedom that you know independent produ production usually demands. Here's another downfall of wireless microphones and any kind of uh, lavalier microphone is that when the actor is moving, it picks up every little scraping of their clothing against that microphone, uh, depending on how you put it on their body. So go ahead and listen to the scene and listen to all the different uh, noises that are being generated when the actor walks and rubs against uh, the, uh, the lavalier mic. Um, Lavalier mics are definitely something you want to be careful with when, you, when you're using because they're easy to, to distort using clothing because when the clothing rubs on it. So if you have a lot of movement in the frame, that's definitely something you want to use a boom mic for. I give up. I just don't have the strength to do it. Since I didn't need them to be actually speaking while they're moving around from position A to position B, it just wasn't a non-issue for me. But um, if you need them to actually be communicating and talking to each other while they're walking and while they're navigating around the room, uh, a shotgun mic might be a better solution for you. In fact, the best thing that you can possibly do is to have lav mics on each one and a boom mic. And then you can choose which one you're going to use for particular scenes. Um, you just connect whichever cable that you want to the, to the camera at that moment and just use that particular device. But just to have it on the ready would be the best thing possible. Uh, let's go ahead and watch some, some takes here. It would be like a wake-up call to live again. I thought it would give me strength. 
And you can't sit around waiting for that one thing either. I lost my dialogue. Cut. So as you heard, she said that she lost her dialogue. And that's when I made the judgment call to go ahead and stop the uh, filming for a moment and give them a little bit to rehearse the lines again because I just felt like they needed it. And they said that they were okay with it and that was cool. That was cool. It was great. So here we go. We're going to pick it up where they picked it up on take number four. I thought that car almost killing me would be like a wake-up call to live again. I thought it would give me strength. I know where you're coming from. But it's not just going to be one thing and all of a sudden it's going to happen to you. And you can't wait for that one thing either. Okay, so as we've noticed, there's more confidence in their voice now. There's more volume in their voice. And they're stuttering and stumbling less on their words. Um, so let's go ahead and watch them get even better and better. I thought it would give me strength. But instead it just gave me false courage. But it's not just going to be one thing and all of a sudden it's going to happen for you. And you can't wait for that one thing either. They're both more in character now. However, they've kind of gone backwards a little bit as far as stumbling on their lines. They're so much more in character now, but because of that, they're kind of losing sight of their lines a little bit because they're in character. Now, here's when the magic starts to happen. Watch this next take. Camera's rolling. You guys ready? Mm-hmm. And action. I thought that car almost killing me would be like a wake-up call to live again. I thought it would give me courage. But instead it just gave me false courage. I know where you're coming from. But it's not going to be one thing and all of a sudden it's going to happen for you. And you can't just wait for that one thing either. Okay, now let's listen to the very first take that we shot again. And then we'll listen to this sixth take. And then again the first take, back to back. I give up. I just don't have the strength to do it. I thought that car almost killing me would be like a wake-up call to live again. I thought it would give me courage. But instead it just gave me false courage. I know where you're coming from. But it's not just going to be one thing and all of a sudden it'll happen for you. And you can't wait for that one thing. I know where you're coming from. But it's not going to be one thing and all of a sudden it's going to happen for you. So which one do you like better? The first one or number six? Um, I've shown this to a few people and I've had very different opinions. Some people prefer the first one because they said it was more genuine and uh, more honest. And some people prefer the sixth one because they said it was more polished and more, you know, professional. Um, so this is where also you come in as a director. Which one do you pick to be in your movie? That's a decision I cannot make for you. Um, I'm just going to, you can go ahead and rewind and watch the, uh, the both takes again and see which one you like better. And you can kind of make a decision as to whether you like the very first honest take or the very last polished take. What I am going to show you is just how important it is to make sure you shoot complete close-ups, which means you shoot the entire scene in close-up from both sides. And here's why. You'll notice that when Jake is talking and Rachel is listening to him talking, um, she's going to be reacting to what he's saying. And if you were to go in and only shoot snippets of dialogue, let's just say only shoot her dialogue and, and only shoot his dialogue um, for, his, for his perspective and then only shoot her dialogue for her perspective, um, you're going to end up with a half a scene because you're not going to be able to cross-cut and cut back and forth later on in post-production, which we'll show you on another DVD, um, and actually have her reaction shots to what he's saying. And to be honest with you, um, a character's reaction to what another character is saying is sometimes ten times more important than what the original character is saying. It's so important to get those reaction shots. Human drama is all about reactions. It's all about her reaction to him telling a story. Now watch her reacting to him telling his story. I give up. I just don't have the strength to do it. Okay, now that we've seen the importance of reaction shots, let's go ahead and watch her close-up. This is after she's had 10 or 11 tries to practice her lines and her dialogue, and also to make sure that she's perfectly in character. And this is also her shot. She knows that this is her close-up. And you'll notice that from any actor that you work with, you're going to get the most out of them when you tell them that you're going to go ahead and do the close-up. 
Um, they know that they're pretty much the uh, focus of the frame, that this is their shot, and they better do a doggone good job, otherwise they're going to pretty much lose out on the whole scene. So, this is her close-up. I know where you're coming from, but it's not just going to be one thing and all of a sudden it's going to happen for you. And you can't sit around waiting for that one thing either. It's a process. You can't let that one thing get you down. Now, of course, don't forget, I'm only showing you the portion where she's talking, but we did shoot the entire scene from that perspective as well, too. And also, technically, just because I said to her that this is her close-up doesn't mean that this is really a close-up. This is actually an over-the-shoulder favoring her. So this is an OTS or an over-the-shoulder shot favoring her. And it's got close-up framing. It's from the top of her head down her shoulders, which is pretty much a technically a close-up framing. But it is an over-the-shoulder shot. Now watch her original wide shot in comparison, stark comparison to her performance in the close-up. But it's not just going to be one thing and all of a sudden it will happen for you. And you can't wait for that one thing. It's a process. But it's not just going to be one thing and all of a sudden it's going to happen for you. And you can't sit around waiting for that one thing either. It's a process. Okay, so now that we've discussed audio and acting, we can go back to the visual aspect of this scene. The first thing we're going to do is white balance, then lighting, then framing. So here we go. Okay, so right after the last scene, we still had the same uh, bluish white balance built into the camera. And just to kind of illustrate how we changed the white balance here to a more normal toned white balance. This is a daylight white balance. And the one previous was essentially using a tungsten bal a white balance while shooting in daylight, which creates a very bluish type of um, color cast. This is the proper white balance for this shot. Um, it's a little bit warmer because we added one of those warm quarter warm card readings. And here's the uh, behind the scenes camera look of the same exact scene just so you can kind of see what it looks like from another camera that's not properly balanced. It just looks kind of ordinary. So here we are flagging the shot. Uh, we're flagging the HMI off of the, the shot just to show you how important the HMI uh, light um, is in this particular situation filling in the shadows. So the first thing we did is we hit him head on with the HMI light. We didn't really diffuse it, we didn't bounce, we didn't do anything. Then we went ahead and tried to go through a reflective disc like this, which when you take out the inside portion of the reflective disc, um, it allows you to filter through it like a very large diffuser. And here I am giving the uh, lens uh, that goes inside the HMI to my DP. And you can really see the pattern of what it's doing here. We're going to go ahead and dim down the camera here you can really see the pattern of the light and how it's being focused through that reflective disc. And you want to try to not spot it too much like that, like we were doing it right there. We ended up not going with the reflective disc at all, actually. We ended up going totally with uh, just bouncing it off the wall, which you'll see the, uh, the effect of in just a second here. Uh, but you can kind of see that you get more, um, more wattage or more power out of the reflective disc, but we just didn't get the right light quality. It was just too harsh. So after we softened up the light, we went to this kind of a look, which is unlit. It doesn't have any light on them at all. We're just balanced with the outdoors to this kind of a look, which is really nice and soft and a lot uh, softer than that harsh, hard light that was on it before. And uh, bear in mind that we're shooting into the setting sun right here. Um, so it's a very, very bright light source in the background. And also look at it in the behind the scenes camera, just how blown out it is. And then look at it in the monitor for the actual uh, A camera that we're using which is properly corrected for the uh, the background. So, so here is David by himself. This is unlit. And as you can see, you really can't see very much of his face. It just looks like almost like a complete silhouette. Uh, kind of reminds you of the beach scene, you know, where um, the, the background is just so intense. And here's when we put a little bit of light on him. You don't need a lot. I mean, we're just doing a very light contrast kind of shot. So we don't need a lot of light on him to balance it out. We just need a little bit. We need to bring up his skin tone so you can see his face a little bit. So now we're going to discuss framing, um, and also not just framing, but the things that you have in the frame. Here's the very first take that we did. You notice it's a little bit dark, and also you can't really see um, Rachel's face at all. Here's the next take right after that. We kind of cleaned it up a little bit, and we uh, you can see more of her face. We turned her around a little bit to the left. Now here's the old take again, just so you can see the difference. Okay, and coming up is the new take again. 
All right, you can see more of her face. It just looks like a nicer frame. Now let's move on. So with this one, we added a hair light for her. There's more light on her hair from the right side. And we also raised the ambient level of light. So there's more light overall in the room. Now watch the old shot. So you can see it's a little bit darker and she's not separated from the curtain. She looks like she's kind of part of that curtain. Whereas when you add the hair light, it separates her from the curtain better. Another thing that we did is we added that coat behind him on the top left hand side uh, to try to cover up a problem with the wall, but it did not work out at all, so we removed it for the next shot. As you can see with this shot, we changed the, uh, the entire shot. We added uh, like uh, the back of a painting there behind him on the left side, removed the, the black coat, and we also changed their blocking entirely. This is the old blocking. You'll notice that because she's closer to us, she appears taller in the frame. She appears like she's eye to eye with him and she also looks bigger, which is unflattering for her and it's unrealistic. And he's actually taller than her and she's smaller than him. So what we did in this shot is we moved her further away from the camera and closer to the curtain. And what that allowed her to do is get to the appropriate height uh, ratio from him. So they appear that he's a little bit taller than her, which is just like as in reality. For this shot, we did a wider shot. We just wanted to get a slightly different perspective, a little bit of a wider shot. And, you know, we liked it a lot. We could see all of her hair. We could see more of him. We could see more of his body movements. Here's the old shot. This is the more medium shot. And then back to the wide shot. And now we went on to one more wide shot. And as you notice, there's a major change. Watch what pops back into the frame. There's that plant back there that's outside. It's a nice plant, but it was just kind of coming out of his chest there, and it looked like a big spider. And watch what happens when it goes away. I mean, it's just, you don't realize some of those things that, that are interfering with your frame and interfering with the shot until you remove them. So usually it's better when you go into a situation like this to remove as many things as possible, make a clean frame, and then start adding things until it feels right. Then after we got done with all the medium shots, uh, we went ahead and got the wide shot. We got one wide shot from this perspective, and then we got a couple more just to kind of get the scene in different, a whole different uh, location in that setting. Here's one more, whole different scene. We just did the entire action in this perspective, in this location, again, um, just on the couch instead of standing by the curtain. And then we did one more. We put her in a whole different position, which is right here. And this is just to kind of increase the ability for us to have choice later on in post. Uh, what if we like one shot better than the other? Um, it's nice to just kind of fully explore a, a setting before you let it go and move on to the next scene. We also did it to kind of show you guys just how many different ways you can shoot something in one location. I mean, this is just one corner of a room and we shot it, you know, five different ways. So there's absolutely no reason why you can't do the exact same thing. Now we're going to talk about uh, lighting her close up, lighting Rachel's close up. So here we are kind of moving the light around, trying to find the best shadow density on her face. And just to kind of show you how, how many different ways you can do light a close-up with just one light. This is one light, just moving around, bouncing against different walls. There's one. There's another one. This is for something if you wanted something a, a lot more moody, you know, like it's candlelight or something. Here's one more. This is more flattering. The light is pointed right above the camera, bouncing back into her face from above the camera. And there's, this is, of course, there's no light on her face. This is just the light pointing in a whole different direction, but it's just hitting him entirely. And this is one more where it's coming from the top left-hand side of the frame, but not above the camera, but more above to the left of the camera. So it's making more of a nose shadow below her nose, and the right side of her face is now shaded. This is the one we ended up liking the best, where the light's coming from right above the camera. And this, the light is actually sitting behind her, directed back up above the camera, bouncing off the ceiling and back into her face. So it's just a really, you know, this is one light. This is what you can do with one light, one tungsten light in a room, and it's just kind of bouncing around everywhere trying to find the best way to, to light her. And it looks great. There's no reason why you would need any more lighting. You could probably throw a hair light in there if you really wanted to, to kind of separate her from the background a little bit, but you really don't need to. It's just whatever you feel is necessary, whatever you feel is enough, just go ahead and light it, get it done, and get on with the scene, and get on to the next scene. Okay, in this section we're going to explore how to move the camera on the tripod. This is just by using a tripod and all the different things that one camera operator can do uh, with just a camera and a tripod, 
and by changing the focus rather than zooming. Um, that's the first shot right there that we're going to talk about. This is another shot, and we're going to talk about a bunch of series of other shots that we did um, at the same time while we were doing these two shots. Um, we did a whole series of locations. This is the first location, just a couple of street sides that we did down in Los Angeles. Um, we selected this particular um, background because of all the different signs that said wrong way. And, uh, you know, it was kind of like a little subliminal thing in the story that, uh, you know, just to kind of tell the uh, audience that we're trying to influence Jake's perspective on his life by making it seem like he's going the wrong way. Um, him looking at a building under construction, you know, as though he's the one under construction. And it's just one of those subliminal things. It doesn't really make an impact on a person. They don't go, oh, okay, well, you know, I get that the director is trying to say that Jake is under construction here. No, it's not like that. It's just one of those things where just by stopping and looking at a building like that, you can enhance the the general ambiance and the general mood of a movie by putting in shots like that that don't necessarily make a major impact or a major statement, but just sort of like little tiny little statements that all build up to a larger meaning in the end. Um, and we shot all these uh, little shots so that we can put them in throughout the movie um, as, you know, uh, Jake going out on little walks of introspection to kind of look inside and figure out what he's doing with his life. For instance, there's another example. Um, I mean, we could have selected any location to shoot this at. It didn't have to be at this particular location, but I like the, uh, the fence and the barbed wire on top and him walking by the fence and the barbed wire as though that he's trying to cross across this threshold of fencing and barbed wire to get into another aspect of his life where he can actually become a writer. And it's just not happening for him. There's this big gate right there and there's a huge fence and it's just kind of preventing him from breaking through. Um, and I, I shot that for expressly for that purpose. I mean, when I shot it, I had that in mind. And you find that when, you, when you're being a filmmaker and when you're going out and shooting these little independent films, these little shots really make a, a huge difference because you think that the audience doesn't get it, but they really do. Even if they don't get it on a conscious level, they get it on an unconscious level. Like I said, these are subliminal um, messages that you're transmitting to the audience. Um, you know, just kind of telling them that you've really thought about this character, you've really thought about this movie, and you know exactly where it's headed and what you're trying to accomplish with it. And they get it, believe me. The audience is extremely intelligent, and they don't, they don't need to be spoon-fed things. If you put in little subliminal things, like, you know, this is supposed to be Jake just walking to the bar. And if he's just walking the bar and he's walking through this neighborhood and there's nothing really much to it and he's just thinking about his life, you have a huge advantage as a filmmaker in that you can select any location at all that you want to subliminally influence your audience um, by use of location, by use of setting. And, uh, you know, that influences the mood in a huge degree. Um, I also want to show you one thing here. When you're shooting and the sun is behind you, you're going to end up with situations like this where you can see my shadow right there on his back that's the camera right there. So you got to pay really close attention. You really can't see those very well in LCDs unless you pay really close to attention of exactly how you're shooting. Uh, just be careful whenever the sun is behind you not to cast your camera shadow on the subject. Um, so the way I cured it is by just going to a lower angle and you can see there's a splotch on my lens right now and I actually did not notice that until I got done filming all these little shots. And so that's one thing that you really want to pay a lot of attention to is to clean your lens along the, uh, along the way as you're doing this. So this is a uh, panning wide shot. This is just a camera on a tripod doing a full 180 degree pan from left to right. And notice how I'm keeping him in the same side of the frame until he crosses to the midpoint right there. Then I lead him out and I pan with him and then I give him back to center. And these work okay just to kind of illustrate an environment. You can use panning wide shots to show an entire environment, like the, the location where he's walking at. But for independent filmmaking, um, they almost never work as well as medium shot or close-up tracking shots. Um, a tracking shot is similar to a panning shot, um, except that you're pretty much tracking the subject like that, where you zoom in, you track the subject, and you get a good frame where you justify him to the left, and you give, you give him a good face room to the right. That's called face room. And then you start racking your focus, and you keep changing your focus as he gets closer and closer, and it gets kind of really fast towards the end there. And then you pan with him as he passes you, and you get that wonderful kind of panning approach where the background is going so much faster than him, and it just 
gives you a sense of movement that a panning wide shot would never ever give you. However, it also does not illustrate the environment or the location like a panning wide shot because it's primarily focused only on the subject. So when you want to draw attention to the subject, you go to a tracking medium shot or close up. And when you want to draw attention to the location or the setting, you go to a panning wide shot. Okay, the other thing we're going to talk about here is a tilt down. You can see how I'm at a lower angle than Jake right here. And as he's walking, I'm just tilting down and panning to the right. Um, what that allows you to do is to kind of create a sense of grandeur to the person, the subject that you're trying to glorify. Um, as in, the uh, the subject, Jake, is kind of larger than life, and he's carrying a lot of weight on his shoulders. So here's the tilt down again. And as you can see, it also allows you to illustrate the sky and kind of blend the, uh, the subject into the sky as he first enters the frame. Um, when we go to a slightly higher angle, we can still tilt down a little bit. As you can see when he kind of walks in right there, I'm still tilting down with him just a little bit and panning to the right. But it's not as profound as when you start at a much lower angle and tilt down and pan to the right. It just has a more of a, a more of a sense of purpose when you're at a lower angle. Let's watch that again. Another thing I also want you to, to notice is that I stayed on the correct line of sight. I'm always on his right side of his body. Um, when I'm doing all these moves, I never switch to the left side of his body. Notice how they cut very well together. It feels like he's always walking from left to right, left to right, you know, of the frame. If I ever were to switch to the other side of his body, which is his left side in this case, he would start to look like he's walking from right to left. So it would kind of look like he's walking back and forth rather than straight to one location from left to right, left to right. Um, and also I did a couple of cutaways, which is a cutaway of this plane right here. What a cutaway allows you to do is, as we discussed before, to pace your editing. Let's just say there was a glitch. Maybe he started one shot from one shot from left to right, and then at the end of that shot, he did something that wouldn't cut with the shot that you wanted to go to. You would insert a cutaway in order to make sure that you can kind of bond the two shots together without making it feel like there's a jump in the action or a jump in the time somehow. Now here's one more shot that's also a close-up tracking shot. We start on a close-up, we stay on a close-up the whole way through, um, and we try to rack the focus as we go. As you can see, he made some big movements on that one. So in the next one, I ask him to make smaller movements and also to walk slower. That way I can continue to rack focus with him a little bit better, which is easier for me as a camera operator too. And as you can see, I was able to maintain focus a lot better than the last shot. And here's one last shot. And this one I had him walk really slowly, just so I can show you just how much easier it gets to maintain the focus the slower your subject gets. That's another aspect of blocking. The more you block your actor better, the easier of a time you're going to have as a camera operator. Okay, now let's talk about diagonal lines. The diagonal line he's about to walk on extends from near the left of the frame towards the right side of the frame. That is going to be a powerful line for you to add to your images as it, to influence the, um, the audience. Where he comes in and he kind of walks to the left and then finds his, the line right there that he wants to walk on and starts to walk along the line. There's a lot of subliminal um, messages being created by this shot. First he's being forced to walk along the line and he looks like because he's not succeeding as a writer he's going to continue walking along the straight line for the rest of his life. But at the same time when he comes into the shot and he leads the audience first to the right, then to the left, then to the right. It creates a little bit of confusion, which kind of also, you know, is a peek into his um, mind, into his the structure of his mind and what he's going through right now in his life. Let's watch that again. So what do we have in this shot? We have a very strong diagonal line that extends from the bottom left-hand corner of the frame all the way to the extreme right-hand side of the frame along the middle. Um, then we have a subject that walks into the shot heading in that same direction. But then as he progresses into the frame, he completely switches directions and walks towards the left side. That leads the audience's eye to the left side now because no longer is the eye following that very strong diagonal line of energy that goes from the left to the right. Now it's following the other line that's created by the motion of the subject towards the left. Then he straightens out again and he walks towards the right side and he kicks a rock. Now, 
what that does, it, it also forces the audience's attention to go back to looking down that strong, energetic diagonal line that goes from the bottom left to the top right. So what you're doing is you're creating a line of energy with the diagonal line from the bottom left to the top right. Then you're inserting the subject into the frame, twisting the, the audience's perception by taking their eye on a whole different path than when they were looking in, which causes discomfort, and then putting it back along, realigned with that original diagonal line. So putting it back the way it was supposed to be. So you're forcing uh, the audience into a, a slight bit of a state of confusion, which in the end subliminally affects the perception of the scene and they feel for the subject. They feel that this subject is going through um, a confusing time in his life. Um, when you look at it in a grand perspective of all the shots that we just saw, the, uh, the shot where he's walking by the barbed wire, the shot where he's kind of alone in the frame as he's walking towards the desolation of that construction area, and this shot right here, within three shots, that's all you did, three shots, you've kind of externalized the character's emotional state. What does that mean to externalize the character's emotional state? You step into novel writing as opposed to filmmaking, which in a novel, um, you live in the character's mind. You know, the, the, you can read their thoughts. You can read about what they're thinking from moment to moment. Whereas in filmmaking, you can't do that. In filmmaking, you have to illustrate the character's thought process by either dialogue or action, uh, physical action, of course. So when you don't want to illustrate something by dialogue or physical action, and the audience already knows enough about this person's life to understand that they're going through a hard time, you want to externalize what they're feeling more by not the use of dialogue or physical action, but just by the use of form and framing and composition. That's how you do it. You take something that, you, you take an environment that the character is walking through, and you make that a voice for their internal machinery of their mind. And I, we just did it with three shots. That's all it is, just three shots. Just the, the one with the barbed wire, the one where he's walking through the construction zone, and the one where he's defined the logic of the diagonal lines. And you'll notice in all these shots that the character, I mean, this is something that we predicated, is walking away from the camera. And we discussed before that when a subject is walking away from the camera, he's diminishing in size, which means he's getting smaller in the frame as he walks away from the camera. Um, why isn't he walking towards the camera? We decided before that when a character or a subject walks towards the camera, they increase in size and that increases action. But that's not what we're trying to do here. We're trying to make it feel that Jake is just getting smaller and smaller and smaller because of his problems. Those are choices that you exercise as a filmmaker. Um, these are all definitely your choices. They're in your mind and in your hands as creative filmmaker. Um, framing, composition, and form in the screen, which is the form of the lines, diagonals, all that wraps up into itself. Instead of, you know when somebody says when you can't tie a knot, tie a lot? Um, that's, that goes true for composition as well too. If you need 20 shots to illustrate someone's difficulty that they're having in their life, um, but you can do the same thing with three shots, do it in three shots. It's going to mean more to the audience to have three very well composed shots that mean something rather than 20 that don't really do anything and instead take away from the movie. So think about your shots, make sure that you think about them before you actually step into it. Uh, make sure that they all have the same kind of mood, form, and appearance. And think about everything subliminally because don't ever think that the audience is not going to get it. Even if they don't get it, like I said, on a conscious level, they're always going to get it on an unconscious level, subliminally. They're a very, very intelligent audience and they're going to get it. So put in the clues, put in all those little uh, hints and all the little bits of form and composition because your audience will appreciate it.